The story of Upbuild began in a monastery. On our quest to understand ourselves more deeply, we recognize that it is our attachment to our egos, our identities, that gets in the way of being our true selves. This podcast will help you understand your ego. It will help you better understand your inner world, the motivations, insecurities, and emotions that affect your every action and relationship. Welcome to Upbuilding the Self. Welcome to Upbuilding the Self. Hi, Michael. I'm Hari Prasad. For those of you who don't know me, it's great to be with you, Michael, today. Great to be with you as well, Hari. Thank you. Thank you. We are discussing something called the freedom fantasy, which is a coining that came in your writing of uh, an upbuild reflection that was very, very poignant to me. The idea of a freedom fantasy is something which actually drove me to become a monk. And I realized the piercing truth, ironically, the truth of the fantasy early on uh, around 2006. And so when you wrote this piece, it resonated in so many ways. And as I was sharing with you just a moment ago, it's so central to the mission of Upbuild that I'm super excited to be here with you and discussing this and sharing this with everyone listening. Thank you for that intro and for sharing how it personally resonated with you. It gives me a lot of energy to now discuss this piece with you. What is the freedom fantasy? The freedom fantasy is the false belief that I have that I will be free and therefore happy when something about my life changes. And it can come in many, many different forms, but there's usually two different ways that I can pick up in myself if I'm having one of these freedom fantasies. There's two different phrases. The first is, I'll be happy when which as I write in the piece are the four most delusional words of the English language because they never actually come true. And then this other little phrase, if only, when I say the words, if only, the implication is that if only something were to happen that's different from my current circumstances, then I'll be happy, then I'll be free. Yeah, and that's really what hit me, that exact insight And it came especially, interestingly enough, I was already exploring a spiritual path and checking out what monks were doing. But there was a book by Milan Kundera called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And we had an exchange on this after you wrote the piece. The Unbearable Lightness of Being had this expression, which I boiled down, I paraphrase to something which is for me the essence and which I will never forget. I was, you know, like 21 years old at the time. And it just really blew my mind. It's that we all draw an imaginary line in the future at which time our present problems shall cease to be. We all draw an imaginary line in the future at which time our present problems shall cease to be. And it was such an aha. I felt like I was (laughs) caught red-handed Because as I was reading that, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm doing this. It's running all the time. It's in the unconscious. It never shuts off. And I thought, I got to stop this madness. (laughs) That, that, That is so well said and exactly it. And that was really the inspiration for this piece is not only the madness that I saw myself experiencing but also how many times I proved myself wrong, how many times I proved myself delusional, because many, many, many good things have happened in my life. Many good things that I had hoped would happen, that I had planned to happen, happened. And yet, as I sit here with you having this conversation today, I still don't feel completely free. And I've experienced moments of happiness And I would consider myself a pretty happy person, but there's still a feeling that something is missing. Still this feeling that I'm not completely happy. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. And you were talking about the inspiration for writing this. Was there any sort of straw that broke the camel's back and gave you this sense that like, okay, this is the freedom fantasy and I've got to write about this? It's definitely a series of small cuts that have clued me in to the existence of this. But I think it was the freedom fantasy that's probably most popular, at least with the people that I know, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So that freedom fantasy that I certainly had for many years and many people that I know have is that I'll finally be free and happy when I'm able to quit my job, have financial freedom, and spend my time however I'd like to spend my time. And I feel a little sheepish to say this, but that was something that pretty much happened for me. After working at a job for 11 years at a bank, I had that financial freedom and I had that ability to choose how I would spend my time. And I also mustered up the courage through a lot of love and support from others to be able to quit my job and to move towards something that I feel really passionate about. And I believe deeply in the mission and something that very much moves me. And even through that whole experience, I still was left feeling that I was not completely happy. I had, quote unquote, achieved the dream, and yet there was still something missing. What's the problem with having that freedom fantasy? I would imagine that I could make a case, well, you're just not spending your time well enough then. If you have all of this opportunity to do whatever it is that you want, and you're still not achieving the happiness, then maybe you're just not spending your time the right way to get that happiness. Yeah, there's a lot of problems. <laughs> you might be right. There's certainly a chance that you're right. Maybe it is true that I wasn't successful enough and that if I get more successful from here, then I'll be happy. But First of all, there, there are two things that make that thesis <laughs> a little bit shaky. The first is, like I said, my own experiences of having saw that line in the future, as you said before, through that quote, and having crossed that line and having it not felt the way that I anticipated it, it feeling. And then secondly, looking at a lot of people who are way more successful than I am, in fact, way more successful than I am in the specific ways that I would like to be successful. And either through direct conversations with them, knowing that that's the case, or just looking at their life and being pretty clear that that's not the case because of some of what you can see in the public eye or otherwise. So it's not going to work to just try to shape things in the best way possible, and then I'll be free you have this conviction. Yeah. In fact, I think part of what you just said is the problem itself. The more we try to, and I consider myself a maximizer and an optimizer, the more we think that we need to get more, the more we entrench ourselves in that belief. I see. Yeah. So give us some more examples to color in what are popular freedom fantasies and how do we know if we're doing this? You can just think about any kind of freedom. There's financial freedom, there's time freedom, freedom to do whatever I want. There's freedom from rules. There's freedom from family issues. <laughs> there's freedom to spend more time with family. So there's lots of different types of freedom. And what I'm currently going through, and this is not something that I had written about in the piece, is just another very specific example of me seeing this come true in my own life. So during COVID and the pandemic, because of different visa issues and travel restrictions, I had spent two years in Japan and had a son during that time and so badly was fantasizing about being able to spend time with my family. And this is an important thing to me. This is not some crazy out of left field fantasy that I was having, but it was a fantasy. And in fact, and it was subtle, but I made a deal with myself 
and this is a little shameful to admit, I, I basically made a deal with myself that I wouldn't be fully happy until I could spend time with my family. And so those two years went by and I felt a lot of discontent around that. And then three months ago, I had a chance to move back to the U.S. And I've been here for three months. I have three more months here and I've been spending great time with my family. And there's a lot of happy moments. But I also noticed the fantasy creeping back in of getting to go back to Japan and missing a lot of the things that are there and were there for me. And also feeling like, actually, it's kind of hard to spend this much time with one's family. <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of family issues that come up. We are so ingrained in one another's lives and there's so many expectations and also things from the past and family issues. There's there's some sense that I'll actually be free when I could be 8,000 miles away and not have to, and still be able to love them, but not have to experience the day-to-day with them as I am right now. And neither of these views are delusional, but I'm not letting myself be happy until that line in the future gets crossed. Fascinating. This is very touching what you're sharing. And I particularly, I didn't know that you had this deal with yourself, as you put it, that I'm not going to be happy until I cross that line. Usually the way that I look at it is, well, I'm not happy now, but I will be happy then. Not that I'm stopping myself from being happy until I get there, but it's just I'm unhappy and I'm throwing myself or I'm dangling a carrot so that I know as soon as I get there, then I will be happy. And this is also very subtle. We don't always experience it as unhappiness. It's just waiting for more, waiting for better, waiting for, as you put it, freedom. And um, what I gained from you right now is that there's also another dynamic. And I also didn't see this in the piece. This is something which is a fresh inspiration I'm getting that we can also hold ourselves back because we're so fixated. So until we get the thing that we want or we cross that threshold, I'm not going to be happy because I'm just fixated and I can't be happy until I've reached that point of getting my fix. Yeah. And those two things are not unrelated and they're not mutually exclusive because when I feel like I'll be happy when, if I were to use those words, either implicitly or explicitly, the implication is that I'm not happy now and I can't be happy now until that thing happens. Mm -hmm. And so the word deal might seem like a little extreme and it's super subtle and it's not said out loud and it's not something that when I'm not thinking about this topic, I'm paying attention to. But there is a subtle deal with myself that I won't be happy until I'm able to cross that line, until I'm able to get the convertible or get the bigger apartment or until the weekend comes and I can have more free time or until some project gets finished and then my schedule will be as I want it to be. I'm forever living in limbo. Yeah. It's always like till the next thing, till the next thing, till the next thing, then I'll be happy. Yeah, that's very uncomfortable. And I think that starts to answer my next question, but there's more light that needs to be shed here. Why is it a fantasy? Why is there no freedom on the other side of these things? Because we're not getting to the root of what real freedom is. We think freedom is one thing. We think freedom are the things that I named earlier, financial freedom, time freedom. But there is only one true type of freedom. And that's freedom from what our ego wants us to be, from an identity of who we think we need to be. And if we're able to see that, then we can start working on things that will actually get us that real freedom. Thank you. So why is the ego at the root of our lack of freedom, or if you think about what that means, it's a, it's a kind of imprisonment. Why is the ego at the root of this? Because the ego, the ego's mechanism 
is to always want us to be more of, bigger, better than what we are. That is the game. Mm -hmm. And if we look at that game, it's a losing game 100% of the time. Because whenever we cross that line, it just puts the line five yards in front of us or 20 yards in front of us or 10 miles in front of us. But if we're never actually able to reach the line and feel satisfied, then it's a losing game. Yes, yes. Now, we've talked about this before, but how do we know that's not just a higher calling towards progress? I mean, well, I should always be getting better. That's just the human spirit. And that's a good thing. And this just pushes me to always be learning and growing and improving and sailing to greater heights of life. So maybe my ego is my real friend. As you like to say, Hari Prasad, the ego is never our friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it keeps us in this game, which might make it seem like it's our friend. And we're certainly not saying that progress or improvement or moving towards our potential are things that we want to shy away from. Those are beautiful things. But the question is why? And we need to be really honest with ourselves about what we are pursuing. And are those games of the ego or are they truly aligned with our real self? Yeah, that's a tall order. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also thinking, just to add to what you've said, the ego is making me never feel enough. So like you were saying that it's, it's always more, better, more, better. And we could rationalize and say, well, that's exciting. That's what's meant to be. That's how I actually grow and, and manifest my potential like we're talking. But it's not, it doesn't work that way. It's not so innocent. The ego is always making me feel not enough. Because you're not already there, you're a failure. Because you're not already there, you're incomplete, you're not whole, you are missing things that you need, and it's your fault. Or justifying it's really the world's fault and blaming like anything. And there's such an interplay between those two things. I don't want to feel it's my fault, so I offload and put it on other people and circumstances but it's all centered around I, me, mine, me, me, me. I should be this. I should be that. I want to be incredible and the world will stop and see, ah, oh, I am something else, right? Even if we have very, very flimsy versions of that, you know, we may come from circumstances that are not allowing us to even think so grandly, or we may have natures that are very different from that. But it's always focused on me. And it's always about how I'm not enough. And that is the ego's torture mechanism. I'm speaking very boldly, because it tortures every single one of us. And how can we experience freedom? How can we experience happiness? When somebody that we believe is constantly telling us, not enough, not enough, not enough. You're not where you should be. You're not what you should be. You're not who you should be. Beautiful. Thank you for that. <laughs> I always feel inspired when you talk about the inner critic and the ego, and you do it in such an articulate way that it hits us right in the stomach where it needs to hit us. <laughs> That's very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have enough experience of my own ego and inner critic, which is the mouthpiece of the ego. It's the voice of the ego that speaks to us. So again, I think we've already touched on this, but to really put a fine point on it, because this is so critical, share with us what is the cost of buying into the freedom fantasy? One of the costs is that we work on the wrong things, is that we pursue things in life that are not actually going to bring us the desired result. So we might work in a job that allows us to climb and climb and climb the success ladder, the status ladder, the financial ladder, 
only to find out 20 years later or 30 years later that what we hoped would happen, we might still get the status and the image and the financial freedom, but what's underneath those things, this true feeling of freedom and happiness and contentment, we don't actually get. And so we work completely on the wrong things and we literally waste our life. So quite a lot is at stake. The other thing is that we experience a life of disappointment. So not necessarily in the things that will take us 20 or 30 years to achieve, but in the more immediate gratifications, getting a new car or having a project be over or getting through a season to get to the next season, we just feel disappointed and let down and still stressed out, even though we hope that we weren't going to be stressed out when this event occurs. And there's just this constant disappointment. And what can happen is we, we start to give up on life. We start to give up any hope that true freedom and happiness is possible for us. Yeah. And this happens so subtly. Sometimes it can take decades or sometimes we never wake up to the fact that, oh, I'm not really happy. It's such a bizarre phenomenon that human beings often think they're happy and we don't have a clue what we're missing. And we don't realize all of the compulsive ways we're chasing after happiness that is still leaving a vacuum. And this is where Socrates talked about the unexamined life is not worth living because we can do so many things, have so many experiences, get our dopamine hits and never actually touch the self, never really be touched by any of it and certainly not touch the self. And that's a very heavy price to pay. And it's one, again, we've talked about this on many occasions because it's so, so vital to the mission of Upbuild. And that's why, again, this conversation on the freedom fantasy just hits the bullseye of what we're trying to achieve here to become the real self and leave the ego behind. It's just that if we continue going through our lives, we will never understand what we're actually meant for. We are all craving happiness, craving I will put it again in bold terms, ecstasy. We're craving such exuberant, ongoing, nonstop ecstasy, that of living the life of the real self, which is something other. It's something totally different from our experience. And it might be a logical takeaway to feel like, well, what I need to do is just be satisfied with what I have right now. And there's a lot of self-help and there's, there's good reasoning for this. It's like we want to experience gratitude and appreciate what we have. And some of the striving that we're doing is not healthy. But if you, if you tell me that I should stop striving for freedom, I mean, that's worse than cutting off both my arms. How can I stop striving for freedom? It's, it's what humans are made out of. It's really the key to everything. There's a lot of scientific studies that freedom is not only associated with happiness, but it actually causes happiness. And so it's a key ingredient in what we're looking for. So it's not about not striving for freedom. We should be striving for freedom. We should just be striving for the right type of freedom, the freedom from always needing to prove ourselves as something better, the freedom from wanting to be bigger and more awesome than we currently are, so that other people will validate us for those things. And living perpetually on this treadmill and feeling like, I mean, the ego makes us work and work and work and it will drain us. And sometimes it will drain us to a point where we become really depressed or we become hopeless, right? Similarly. So the ego, make no mistake, as Michael was saying, the ego is not our friend. The ego is not our friend. It is really a taskmaster that is promising freedom and never delivering on it. It's giving empty promises one after another for the rest of our lives. And we miss out on our lives 
when we follow it unquestioningly, which is the default state. So it's a heavy cost, a heavy cost and universally relevant. I myself am also a victim of the freedom fantasy as being in the ego's clutches, but I'm trying to get out of it. So take us out of this, Michael. What can we do to actually get free, to be free of the freedom fantasy and to go into real freedom? The first thing, as is almost always the answer for any of these deeper questions about life, is we need awareness. And so we need to ask ourselves, what are we currently fantasizing about that is not going to actually bring us the freedom that we hope for? So we should get very clear. These are the three, five, we might have thousands of them, but there are usually a couple of bigger ones that are consistent narratives in our life about what are, what are the freedom fantasies that we have? And let's be really honest about that. And it might take stepping into your shame in order to see that and to have a guide or a friend or a family member who can help you process that and receive that is, is really helpful. The other thing is that if you still aren't, <laughs> if you still aren't convinced that the success that you're looking for in whatever area you're looking for it is not going to bring you the freedom that you're looking for, then find a bunch of people or at least one who have achieved what you want in the area that you want it and ask them, how's it going for you? Is it everything that it's cracked up to be? And get a real perspective from somebody who actually has that experience. And that can be incredibly illuminating. And then the third thing is to look at what are the attachments that I have? How do I want the world to perceive me? And look at those ego identifications and see how might I start to soften those attachments. Wonderful. So the first step is to catch myself in the act. So very specifically, what are my freedom fantasies? Pick five, let's say, right? Then check in with people who may be achieving some of these, who may have gotten to the other side. What is it like for them? Is it freedom? <laughs> How much so? Also be careful who you ask because they may paint a different picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, life is amazing now. I'm amazing. I may not say that, but like life is just awesome. Oh, you got to get to where I've gotten to. So we do need some discrimination in terms of who we look at and, and who we ask and how we take that. But the point is so helpful to see, like, did other people really get what they were looking for? I mean, I always think about George Harrison. I'll come back to that example in a moment. He had achieved a lot. What was that like for him? The third step is then to try to soften the attachments, see what are my ego identities and soften the attachments. So what are my freedom fantasies? Number one. Number two, checking in. Is it really panning out for people who have gotten those things? Three, seeing what are my ego identities and trying to let go, peel off those layers. Yeah, and just to make number three concrete, because as we're talking here, I'm realizing it can feel a little fluffy and light. For me personally, when I shifted from working at a bank to working at Upbuild, there was and still is a lot of orientation towards success and being seen in a very positive light as a wise person who can deliver results to people <laughs> and help them along their journeys and getting credit for that stuff. And that orientation was also there before I joined Upbuild. So that's something that has stayed with me. But the softening of that, what that can look like, and Hari, you've been so helpful in this, Razanath and Vipin, and our whole Upbuild community is, can I orient a little less towards that and a little more towards the mission, which we're all really here to serve, which is to help people become free from their egos and to be their best selves. And if I orient a little bit 
less towards the first and a little bit more towards the latter, things start to change. Hopefully one day they will go away completely, but they haven't. They start to soften and actions look different. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That's exactly what we need. The example of George Harrison, I always love to share because he achieved every freedom fantasy that I had practically, at least in the broad strokes. <laughs> you know, he was on top of the world. He had all of the fame and influence, power that comes with that. He was adored by the opposite sex. People were fainting. Ladies were fainting by seeing him. I mean, this is like really super extreme. It's it's like a an inflection point in history. And he was a musician. He was doing art. He was bringing joy to the world, you could say. And he was so masterful at it. He's considered one of the best guitarists of all time. We can say that he was crushing it. <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah, in today's yeah. lingo. That, guy, that guy, George, <laughs> she was killing it. Yeah. <laughs> and he could have anything he wanted. And he could use his time however he wanted. And his response to that was, are you serious? Is that it? This is it? Everything that there is to be achieved in this world? This is it? Not everybody comes to that reckoning. But he was not going to live an unexamined life. He was very conscientious and conscious of his lack of happiness, his lack of feeling free. So he embarked on a journey of self-realization to let the ego go and to invest in the practices that cultivate the real self. And then he was just sharing that through his music. He used all of his fame, his money, his influence, everything, not to enjoy himself more, but to serve people. And he did so in the most heart-melting way. I mean, I can't listen to his music without crying, especially My Sweet Lord, the most famous of his solo tracks. It's just so, so special. It's coming from a different place altogether. And it's so helpful to have these examples and people that lived in this world that went through the same struggles that we go through, people that we admire, people that are really like close to home. I mean, you might say well, he's not close to home because he's at a different stratosphere than the way that I live, but certainly a household name and somebody who's been through it all, including being poor. And um, I get so much hope and so much clarity from seeing such an example and knowing what can be achieved, you know, by the end, by the end of his life. And he went through so much. There was definitely a sense of the ultimate freedom. I can't say more than that because his, his life is private also. But from those who knew him, he achieved really uh, a very great height of consciousness and self-realization. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm also remembering when I heard that song, My Sweet Lord, way before I became immersed in the world of Upbuild and learned about him through a spiritual lens. When I, whenever I would listen to that song, and I would, I would listen to it whenever I needed a, a mood boost, because whenever I listened to it, it gave me that mood boost. I could feel the joy and, dare I say, freedom that he was feeling communicated through those words and through the tune. So if any of our listeners are not familiar with that song, please listen to it. And if you are familiar with that song and you want a little bit of freedom, please also listen to it. it it's a beautiful one. I love that. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. And I, I also just appreciate your coining of the freedom fantasy. You take these subjects that somehow make something which is critical on our path so clear and so narrowly focused and something which is memorable that stays with us. And I, I find that takes a lot of empowerment, <laughs> a lot of great inspiration, forward thinking, and ability to communicate. So the freedom fantasy is just a, a perfect coining to keep with us. So I would encourage everybody 
remember our freedom fantasies. And I've gained so much from talking to you about it and going so targetedly into that direction of our self-work and how the ego binds us and what it means to become free from it. So thank you, really very grateful. Thank you, Hari. And I, I consider myself a very logical person who doesn't have a lot of fluffy fantasies. So it took some shame to be able to step into this notion that actually I'm experiencing fantasies all the time. And as always, thank you for guiding this conversation and for adding your insights and actually for teaching me all this stuff in the first place. So too sweet. I really appreciate the time with you today. It's such a joy and, and a privilege. Thank you. And thank you to everyone listening. Thank you for listening to Upbuilding the Self. Upbuild is a leadership development company that offers workshops, coaching, and other services to help you on the path towards being your best self, free from the shackles of the ego. To learn more about our work, visit our website, upbuild.com, and sign up for our newsletter to gain access to podcasts, reflections, and upcoming events. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes to leave us a review so that others can find and benefit from the podcast. We look forward to being with you again next time.